By your spirit, O Lord, show us truth. Through Christ, the living word, in whom we see your face, amen. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came of her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep, so the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, there is already a stench because he has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. This is the word of God for the people of God. On Monday night, this sanctuary was full of people. They were here for the Durham CAN meeting with candidates for mayor and Durham City Council. My husband Rick worked as a community organizer once upon a time, and he was nearly levitating uh, with excitement to see so many people turn out for an action, as they call it in the business. I imagine that at least, at least a few of those four or 500 people that were here on Monday noticed the stained glass in our sanctuary. If they were church people, they saw the big names of the faith. There's Mary and the baby Jesus over here. Further back, there's Dorcas, who is handing out clothes to the poor. Over here, we have the gospel writers, Matthew and Mark on the left, and Luke and John on the right. Between them, the Old Testament prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. Upstairs, there's Moses with his nine commandments and six fingers. <laughs> I never get tired of that window. If there were Methodists in the crowd, they might have recognized John Wesley at the back, preaching on his father's tomb. Mary, Mark, Isaiah, Dorcas, John, these are the names you'll find on Bible trading cards. Yes. That is a thing. These are the holy people, the saints. But chances are that some of those people who were here on Monday night were not church people. And in these windows, they saw ordinary folks like you and me, a mother and her child, a generous woman, an old man, a young man. Their clothes and their hairstyles place them in another time and place, but otherwise they look like regular folks, just like you and me. On a day when the weather's fine and the sun hits at the right angle, this sanctuary glows with light and color, with the sun shining through the glass. On those sparkly, sunny days, the windows give us a pretty good image of what a saint is. A saint is an ordinary person, illuminated and empowered by the light of God and made holy. A saint is, the per is a person who the light shines through. We all know these ordinary holy people. Whether they're saints known by many or saints known by few, they are all claimed and beloved by God. We honor them today, this All Saints Day. This may be a tough service for some of us, especially those who have lost loved ones uh, recently in the last year. Grief makes us brittle, and the fresher the grief, the more likely we are to fall apart. 
Grief is unpredictable. We might laugh instead of cry. We might sit when everyone else is standing. It's all good. It's all welcome, especially today. I invite everyone as we sit in worship this morning to make a little place, a hollow in your hands, a position of prayer to hold your saints and the emotions that you're feeling. Imagine as we sit together that our hands are God's hands holding us and the people who we hold so dear. With our hands in that position, let us pray. Lord, may the souls we hold and remember today rest in your eternal light and peace. Comfort those who grieve. Be with us as we worship you, who are life and light and love. Amen. My friend Gary died in January. He was a respected lawyer who worked for Attorney General Roy Cooper. He was also a goofball, as you can see. He was Ellen's husband and Jeff, Sarah, and Ian's dad. His favorite writer was Flannery O'Connor, whose vivid stories are full of ordinary sinners and saints. Gary was tall and witty, brainy and kind. He also had a tendency to curse and complain, and he didn't suffer fools very gladly. He would have made an excellent grumpy old man. His buddies on the Cary Presbyterian Church softball team might have told you that Gary was no saint. But they would also tell you that he loved his people. He served his church, he worked for justice, and several times a year he took a turn in the pulpit. We were youth advisors together, which surely earned him some saint points. He was an ordinary, sacred man of God. Gary's heart stopped one night at bedtime. He made it to Rex Hospital, where he stayed, mostly unconscious but clearly in pain, for two weeks before he died. Many of us visited him and pleaded with God, as Mary and Martha did, for Lazarus. God, we know you can save him. It's agony to see Ellen and the children in such un so heartbroken. It's unbearable to think of Gary leaving this world so soon. You're here. Bring him back, Lord Jesus. Call him out of this dark place. As we sit with cupped hands holding the memory of our loved ones, we might struggle with this story of Lazarus. We might wonder, why didn't God restore my beloved brother or parent or spouse or friend? We might say with Mary and Martha, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. How could Jesus drag his feet at a time like this? How could a loving God allow this sort of pain? What are we to make of Lazarus? Well, the story of Lazarus shows us God's power. He's able to raise a man from the dead. At first, Jesus seems to resist this show of power. He knows that physical death is necessary, but it is not ultimate. And he wants us to focus on the ultimate. Jesus asks God to allow him this miracle for the sake of the crowd. For our sake, a man is raised from the dead, and we see God's power. Gary did not return from the dead, and we don't expect him to. But God's power was evident in the brilliant medical minds that cared for him, the gentle hands that nursed and prayed for him, and the merciful end that came to his human suffering. In this day and time, these are ordinary things, perhaps, but no less miraculous. The story of Lazarus also shows us Jesus' purpose. The Gospels tell us that he performed many miracles, but miracles were not his main mission. Jesus didn't come to eliminate our pain and suffering and physical death. 
He came to be with us and for us in our suffering and to save us from spiritual death. Jesus is moved by the suffering of his friends, Mary and Martha, and he himself grieves for Lazarus. We read that Jesus weeps. In this moment, we see the depth of his humanity, his willingness to give himself fully to the vulnerability of love. We're reminded that great joy and deepest grief are not opposites, but the most intimate of twins. We don't experience one unless we have known the other. Jesus, so deeply human, came to lead us through the darkness back to the heart of God, after this life in the state we call heaven, and also here in community with our neighbors. This state of reconciliation and communion is what we mean by the kingdom of God, and ushering in that kingdom was Jesus' purpose for Mary and Martha, for Gary and Ellen, for each of us who knows joy and grief. This was Jesus' purpose. The story of Lazarus compels us also to participate in God's work. In addition to Jesus, this story is about the faith of Martha and all those saints who love with casseroles and childcare and rides to the doctor. It's about Mary and those who love through prayer and contemplation, devotion. It's about Lazarus who responded to Jesus' call and it's about the unnamed people who obeyed Jesus when he said, roll away the stone, unbind him, and set him free. Jesus loved these people. He was moved by them. He worked and works his miracles in and through them. Ordinary sacred people of God who through faith reflect God's light even in the dark valley of their own grief. Saints are the people who the light shines through. We know that there are official saints and there are suspected saints. Melissa helped us think about that in uh, cross-generational Sunday school this morning. These people, these suspected saints, will probably never appear in the headlines or in a stained glass window. As Methodists, we claim the priesthood of all believers and the possibility that any one of us might be a person who the light shines through. We are all saints in the making. Suzanne Sartell, who's a member of our church, posted a quotation on Facebook uh, this week from Catholic writer and teacher Richard Rohr. He said, in 2010, I was invited to meet with Bishop Desmond Tutu in Cape Town. He told me that he and I were mere light bulbs. We get all the credit and seem to be shining brightly for all to see, but we both know that if this light bulb were to be unscrewed from its source for even a moment, the brightness would immediately stop. Like Desmond Tutu, the people I suspect of being saints tend to take credit for the ordinary in themselves, and to give credit to God for the sacred. They shine brightly because they don't allow themselves or their own egos to muddle the light of God. They stay connected to the source. In a few minutes, we'll be invited to honor our saints in several ways. We'll call their names, ring the bells, and light candles in their honor. We will celebrate the light that's shown in their lives and through them in our own lives. We'll take Holy Communion and celebrate our membership in the body of Christ. As you receive, imagine that the bread and the juice are the light and love of God. We'll declare our belief in the communion of saints, ordinary people at times far from saintly in their behavior, who, made, who were made holy by their participation in Christ. These are the great cloud of witnesses who surround us as we walk the path of faith. Friends, we are all saints in the making, 
So answer God's call to serve, to contemplate Jesus, to roll away the stone, to unbind the captive, and to set them free. On this All Saints Day, we remember those who have gone before us in whom we have seen the image of God. By God's grace, may we also be people who the light shines through. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.